in because today we're going deep on some pretty heavy stuff quantum immortality and no it's not like you know finding some magical fountain of youth or anything this is way weirder than that we're talking about the idea that death like actual death might not be the end well at least not in the way we usually think about it it's a really fascinating concept and it comes out of this thing called the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics or as the cool kids call it mwi Basically, it suggests that every time you have a quantum measurement happening, reality kind of splits and it creates like a separate branch for every single possible outcome. So hold on. Are you saying there's a universe out there where like I tripped coming in here and spilled coffee all over myself and another one where I, I don't know, I won an Olympic gold medal in curling? OK, the possibilities are kind of exciting, but also a little bit terrifying. Yeah, you got it. And to really understand this whole quantum immortality thing, we need to dig into those basic ideas of quantum mechanics, especially the MWI. And our main guide for this deep dive is a video called, you guessed it, Quantum Immortality and the Many Worlds Interpretation. Okay, so let's start with a super quick quantum mechanics 101 crash course. You know, for those of us who didn't spend years in physics labs, what are like the key things we absolutely have to know to even begin to wrap our heads around this whole thing? Well, one of the like really foundational ideas is this thing called superposition. Well, imagine a coin, right? And it's spinning in the air until it lands. It's both heads and tails at the same time. That's kind of what particles are doing in the quantum world. They exist in multiple states until you actually measure them. So it's like they're living a double life, kind of a quantum Hannah Montana situation. Okay, I think I'm with you so far. But how does this, you know, double life thing connect to reality actually splitting? That's where the MWI really comes in. So in the old school Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, when we measure a particle, its wave function, which basically describes the probabilities of different states, collapses. And we only see one outcome. But the MWI says, hold on. That's not how it works. It proposes this idea that the wave function never actually collapses. Instead, every single possible outcome actually happens. And this causes reality to branch into these separate universes, and they can't interact with each other. Wait a second. So if I'm getting this right, instead of that coin landing on heads or our tails, in the MWI, it lands on both. And that creates two separate universes, one where it's heads and one where it's tails. Exactly. So with that double slit experiment we talked about before, instead of the electron going through one slit or the other, it goes through both, but in different branches of reality. And yeah. each one of those branches shows a different version of like how things could happen. Okay. My brain is starting to hurt a little bit, but I got to ask if this splitting thing is happening all the time, like constantly at the quantum level, shouldn't we be seeing these alternate realities like somehow? That's a really good question. And the answer is in something called decoherence. It's basically why we don't see big things, like a chair, existing in multiple states at the same time. You see, as a system starts interacting with its environment, the different branches of its wave function become more and more separate. Yeah. And they lose their ability to interfere with each other. So it's like each branch becomes its own little world. Yeah. And there's no way to cross over. Kind of like those parallel universe things you see in sci-fi. But instead of traveling through wormholes or whatever, we're just constantly splitting off into these different realities. That's a pretty good analogy. Yeah. And this brings us to what we really want to talk about. Quantum immortality. It's the idea that even in like life or death situations, there's always going to be a branch of reality where you survive. Okay, this is where things get really interesting and maybe a little creepy. So are you saying even if, let's say, I got hit by a bus, there's a universe where I somehow dodge it? Yeah, 
Exactly. In some branches, maybe the bus swerves at the last minute. In others, maybe you trip right before. And in some, of course, this is all theoretical. Don't try that at home. Mm. And it's super important to remember that even in the branches where you do survive, things might not be great. You could still end up with some pretty bad injuries. Okay, yeah, that's a good point. Surviving doesn't necessarily equal a happy ending. It could mean living with some serious consequences. So it sounds like this whole quantum immortality thing isn't just about living forever. It's a lot more complicated than that. Exactly. And actually, David Lewis himself knew this. He even said that surviving all the time could lead to a, and I'm quoting him here, life of eternal torment. You know, where you just keep getting worse and worse outcomes in each branch. Oof. Eternal torment. That doesn't sound like my idea of a good time. So is there anything that, like, argues against this whole quantum immortality thing? It seems like a pretty out there idea. Oh, absolutely. There are a bunch of really good challenges to this idea. One of them is based on this thing called anthropic reasoning. So think about it. If we really did live forever, statistically, it's not likely we would be in our current relatively young state. Like, why are we experiencing life now when there could be infinite versions of us spread across time? It's weird. Yeah, that makes sense. It's like winning the cosmic lottery, being alive and kicking right now. But hold on. What if our future selves are so different from us now that they're basically a whole different category? Could that explain why we are where we are? That's possible. Some experts have suggested that. But it still leaves a ton of unanswered questions. Another challenge comes from something called the corrected intensity rule. That's how David Lewis tries to say, hey, it's okay to ignore the branches where you die. He says that death is basically oblivion. So those branches don't count when we're calculating probabilities. Wait, hold up a minute. Isn't that a huge assumption? Who's to say those branches don't matter just because we can't experience them? You're totally right to be skeptical. And a lot of experts disagree with Lewis on that. A physicist named David Deutsch is one of them. He says ignoring those branches is basically just adding something random to quantum theory. There's no real reason to do it. It's kind of like saying we're only going to count the lottery tickets where we win and just ignore all the losing ones. That's totally going to mess up the odds. But OK, even if we do go along with this whole surviving in some branch thing, does that mean we should just be cool with potentially awful things happening in those other branches? Like just because I can't experience death doesn't mean I want to end up like a brain in a jar in some other universe. Yeah, that's a super valid point. Physicist Sean Carroll actually uses a more, you know, down to earth example to talk about this. He says, imagine someone is about to shoot you. You're not going to be OK with it just because you can't experience being dead. That fear of death, it's real, no matter what might be going on in other universes. So it really seems like this quantum immortality thing is more of a philosophical puzzle than like a scientific fact. Mm. But even if we put aside the whole living forever debate, the whole idea of having multiple selves splitting off into these different realities is still mind blowing. Absolutely. It raises huge questions about what it even means to be you when you have this constantly branching multiverse. All right, let's go down that rabbit hole next. I'm ready to talk about what this all means for our sense of, you know, who we are. OK, so we've we've kind of figured out that this whole quantum immortality thing is a bit of a mess. Like, it's not as simple as it sounds. But even if we don't buy into, you know, actually living forever, the idea that there are multiple selves branching off and doing their own thing in different realities, still, it's still a lot to wrap your head around. Like, what does that even mean for who we are, for our sense of self? That's the big question, isn't it? If every single time something is measured at the quantum level, we get all these versions of ourselves, what does it even mean to be you? Yeah. It really makes you think differently about what identity even is. Yeah, I'm already getting a little dizzy thinking about it. So what are some of the ways people are looking at this? Do physicists even have any idea how to approach this question? Well, there are a couple of different ways of thinking about it. There's a physicist, Brian Greene, and he says we basically need to think of the self in a much broader way. He thinks each copy is you and that the real you is kind of like all those versions together across all the different branches. He even says, and I'm quoting him directly here, when you fully embrace the implications of quantum mechanics, the idea that observations, measurements, interactions, entanglements, these are the essential processes that bring the physical world into being, it leads to a very different perspective on what the self is. So hold on. You're saying I'm not just me sitting here talking to you. I'm also like 
the rock star me in another universe, the astronaut me somewhere else, and maybe even, I don't know, the me that's a world famous chef in another reality. It's a pretty wild idea. I'll give you that. But honestly, it kind of feels like a cop out. Does it really matter if I'm a rock star somewhere else if I have zero connection to that version of me? Yeah, I get that. And not everyone agrees with Green. Like, there's another physicist, Lev Vaidman, and he takes a more practical view, you know. He says, yeah, okay, there are all these beings out there that are just like me. But, he says, there's no other I. They all came from the same place, from him, but they aren't literally him. It's kind of like, uh, you know, how a tree branches out. Each branch is different, but they all share the same roots. Okay, I think I see what you mean. So maybe it's less about one me spread out everywhere and more about having a ton of, like, counterparts who came from the same place but are basically their own people. Each time things split, it's like a new me is created. That actually makes me feel a little better about the whole thing, to be honest. That's definitely one way to look at it. And then there's this philosopher, David Wallace, and he takes things even further. He says, maybe this whole idea of having a fixed self, one that doesn't change, is an illusion. It's just something our brains made up because we don't see the full picture. Maybe in a constantly branching multiverse, the idea of you just kind of disappears. Whoa, okay, that's getting pretty deep. So you're saying quantum immortality maybe doesn't mean I live forever. But it could mean there's no me in the first place. It's kind of like trying to hold on to smoke, you know? It definitely makes you rethink some pretty basic ideas about who we are and what it means to exist. Yeah, this is making my head spin almost as much as all those different realities. It kind of reminds me of another one of those big mysteries in physics, the black hole information paradox. Didn't Stephen Hawking spend years trying to figure out what happens to information when it goes into a black hole? Yeah, he did. And it's still a huge puzzle for physicists. Mm. You have general relativity saying anything that falls into a black hole is gone forever. But then you have quantum mechanics saying, no way, information can't be destroyed. They can't both be right. It shows us how much we still don't get about physics. So are we saying quantum mechanics and the idea of the self are like clashing? <laughs> Is it that our brains just can't handle this level of weirdness? I mean, if someone like Stephen Hawking had trouble with this stuff, how are we supposed to understand it? Well, that's a really good question. Cosmologist David Albert actually suggests that maybe this whole debate about quantum immortality means we're missing something really important. Maybe we don't really understand the many worlds interpretation or even consciousness itself. Maybe there's a big piece of the puzzle we haven't found yet. Okay, that's kind of exciting, but also frustrating. It's like we've stumbled into this giant unknown area and we're just starting to explore it. But even if we don't figure out all the secrets of the universe or ourselves today, what are some like real world things we can learn from the many worlds interpretation? Does it change how we think about making choices or free will or even how history happens? It definitely brings up some interesting questions. Think about the Cuban Missile Crisis, for example. Back in 1962, the world was super close to a nuclear war. A Soviet submarine near Cuba was surrounded by American destroyers. The Americans started dropping these practice depth charges, trying to get the submarine to come up to the surface. But the Soviet captain couldn't get in touch with Moscow, so he thought they were under attack. Wait, yeah, I remember reading about this. That was a seriously intense moment. Wasn't there, like, a real chance the Soviet captain would launch a nuclear torpedo? Exactly. The captain told his crew to get ready for a nuclear strike and his political officer agreed with him. But the second in command, a guy named Vasily Arkhipov, he refused to okay the launch. He said they had to wait for confirmation from Moscow before doing something that drastic. That sounds incredibly brave considering the situation. So what happened? Well, Arkhipov managed to talk the captain out of it. They brought the submarine up and the crisis was over. A lot of historians think Arkhipov basically saved the world from a nuclear war. Wow, talk about dodging a bullet, literally. But how does this connect to the many worlds thing? Well, if you think about it using the MWI, it means there must be branches where Arkhipov didn't step in, where they launched the torpedo and, well, nuclear war happened. But we obviously can't experience those branches because, well, we wouldn't exist. So does that mean we only exist because we always end up in the branch where things don't go totally wrong? Is there some kind of cosmic safety net that makes sure we survive as a species? It's a little freaky to think about all the universes where things weren't really bad. It's definitely something to think about, yeah. Yeah. It makes you wonder about probability, about the choices we make, and even if there's really just one true history. I don't know if I find that comforting or terrifying. It's like we're living in the best possible outcome, but there are all these other realities where things went horribly wrong. Okay, before we go too far down that road, let's come back to this whole selfhood thing. 
we've talked about all these different ways to think about what it means to be you in a many world situation. But does any of this actually change anything for us? I mean, even if there are infinite versions of me out there, I'm still stuck with this one for now. So does it really matter? No, that's a great question. And it's something everyone has to figure out for themselves. Even if we don't totally understand the many worlds interpretation, it forces us to think about some really big questions. Questions about who we are, the choices we make, and what reality actually is. Yeah, this is a lot to take in. I think I need a break. <laughs> All right, I'm back. And my brain is still kind of fried from all this talk about, you know, splitting realities and different versions of ourselves running around. It feels like every time we think we're getting a handle on things, more questions just pop up. Yeah, it can definitely feel that way. It's like exploring this giant maze. And the further you go, the more twists and turns you find. But I think even if it doesn't lead to like one clear answer, the exploration itself is what's really valuable. I totally agree. And it makes you realize just how much we don't know about, you know, the universe and how we fit into all of it. It's kind of humbling, but also pretty exciting at the same time. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, the video we've been talking about, the one on quantum immortality, it actually touches on this sense of wonder a bit. They quote a philosopher, Peter Lewis. And even though he doesn't really buy into the whole quantum immortality argument, he does say this, and it's kind of cool. Certainly, the many worlds theory has the following consequence. At any future time, there is a branch containing a living successor of you. So even if I, like, trip and fall into a black hole tomorrow, there's another me out there somewhere who's still going strong. That's a pretty weird thought. But I guess there's some comfort in knowing that somewhere, a version of me is still out there doing their thing. It's a strange kind of comfort, yeah. Mm -hmm. The video even jokes that maybe in some other reality, Hugh Everett, the guy who first came up with the whole many worlds idea, is still alive. And maybe he even won a Nobel Prize for his work. Who knows? Ha, huh, now that would be something. Maybe we could even meet our other selves at some, like, giant interdimensional party. <laughs> okay, okay, maybe I'm getting a little carried away here. But seriously, this whole idea of branching realities, it just opens up so many possibilities. For sure. And even though we might never be able to prove or disprove any of this, I think the important thing is how it changes our perspective. Yeah. It makes us rethink things we thought we knew for sure. You know, it's funny. We started off talking about quantum immortality, about whether we could actually live forever. But in a way, it feels like we've stumbled on something even bigger than that. Maybe even if this version of me doesn't last forever, there are all these other versions of me out there living out every possible way my life could go. So a part of me does keep going, even if it's in a reality I can't see or touch. That's a really nice way to put it. It kind of gets at how powerful ideas can be. Yeah. Even if we're just individuals and we don't live forever, the things we do, the choices we make, our thoughts even, they all have these ripple effects. They spread out and create this web of possibilities. Yeah. And it's way bigger than anything we can see or understand. I like that. The ripple effects. It's like every time we make a choice, it creates a new wave, a new branching point, And that sets off a whole chain of events. We can't see all of it. But it's all there, shaping the multiverse. It's almost like a piece of us lives on in every choice we make, every path we take, every life we touch. It's a pretty powerful image, right? It reminds us that even the small things we do can have a big impact. It shows how connected everything is and how amazing the universe is. Well, I think my mind is officially blown. I need a minute to process all of this. Definitely take your time. These are the kinds of ideas that you can spend a lifetime thinking about. Or maybe even multiple lifetimes. Who knows? I think you might be right about that. So to everyone listening, whether you're a physics whiz or just starting to learn about quantum stuff, keep asking questions. Keep exploring. And don't lose that sense of wonder. There's so much out there we still don't know. Absolutely. The universe is full of surprises, and we're really just getting started. And that's it for another mind-bending deep dive. We'll be back soon with more fascinating topics, ready to push the limits of what we know and challenge how we see the world around us. Until then, stay curious and keep those brains working. Thanks as always for watching today. And if you like our videos, please don't forget to click on the like button and comment in the comment section. And if you already haven't done so, why not subscribe? It is completely free. Yeah, thanks for watching, everyone. It's much appreciated. Love from Team DDU.